at least for me. And uh, we will see what Java offers uh, for us to, to create really great and uh, high scalable, maintainable, uh, and debuggable application. And we have uh, following agenda for today. First of all, we need to wrap up difference between CPU and IO bound for cloud. Then um, uh, I briefly describe what is the project Loom and uh, what is the virtual virtual threads and uh, uh, structured concurrency and what is relation to project Loom. So let's go. Uh, CPU bound for cloud means we burst CPU almost all time. And But what does it mean burst CPU? It means we are uh, uh, using lots of uh, CPU instructions such as uh, data memory allocations, uh, traversing uh, or other related uh, instructions and we can find it in sorting, search, uh, matrix multiplication, artificial intelligence and uh, <clears throat> uh, training model. And uh, Java offers a uh, fork joint framework, of course, uh, to handle the CPU intensive uh, workload. And also we have parallel streams that basically is built off top of uh, fork joint framework. Also, we have a bound workload, and uh, key difference here is that almost all time we are waiting for something, and the something is namely IO, input output, and it's also about uh, write read uh, on disk on to the network, and um, if some of you may recognize uh, where you, where are we using uh, this pattern in which application, in which kind of applications we are using. And you are right, always and in most cases we are using multi-threaded server where we have a limited thread pool. And in order to process uh, one request, we need the dedicated uh, thread. Um, in it's not a secret that it's easy to develop uh, debugging profile because we have very straightforward uh, code, uh, sequential, but it has very serious drawbacks. Uh, they don't utilize properly our CPU and it's a problem. And as a result of this, we have limited scalability and here is a little slow in action. Uh, where we have, for example, some duration to process one request and we can have, and we can uh, handle uh, concurrently some number of tasks. And our throughput will be n divided by uh, this time. So it means uh, how many requests we can handle divided by uh, what is the uh, uh, duration to handle one request. For example, we, uh, our, in order to handle one request, we, we need to spend one second and uh, we can execute 100 concurrent tasks. It means our throughput will be 100 FPS. No magic. <clears throat> Sorry. Sorry. Um, and of course, source code. Uh, as I mentioned before, very straightforward source code, easy to understand. Maybe at the first glance, it can be very complex, but in fact, we just have sequence uh, sequence of instructions. So I believe it's easy to understand, no issues here. But here's the problem. Um, since we have limited uh, scalability, but what does it mean limited scalability? In order to uh, scale our web application, we need the threads, but problem is that we can't just create as many threads as you, as you need. It's just not possible. And let's figure out why we can't. Uh, in Java, 
we have the following mapping between uh, Java platform thread and operating system thread one to one. And in fact, uh, Java thread it's a wrapper around operating system. And when you create and start new threads, there are lots of communication between uh, GVM and operating system because you need to allocate uh, some block of memory, uh, go to operating system and say, hey, please uh, do, is, uh, do for me uh, this stuff, that stuff, then this created um, uh, blocks uh, and, uh, and header should be registered inside GVM. And it's not for free. It's very, uh, it costs very, very well. <clears throat> and uh, some of you may argue and say, hey, come on, uh, we are not uh, cooking a web server in a thread per request uh, style. And we are a smart guy. We are using asynchronous uh, style where we have event loop and everything in this uh, style event. and. When a request comes, we register a callback for clients. And if we have some IO intensive operations, uh, we create subscription for this when we receive response from database or whatever kind of IO. Uh, we are chaining uh, these callbacks uh, into some kind of pipeline and send uh, response to the uh, client. And indeed, it scale uh, very well, and we uh, utilize CPU also very well. But it has very big problems in terms of maintainability, debugability, and profiling. Um, here is example of uh, such code. It's using completable futures. Uh, you can't use. Uh, try catch, for example, all loops here. It's just not possible. You need to, to follow the same style of code. Another example using Java Rx. Um, yeah, it's a beautiful, to be honest. Um, and if some of you had a chance to debug Vertex, for example, um, understand this pain, it's really pain. And another thing, when you are trying to uh, to debug something in Intel IG, for example, and you put breakpoints, and Intel IG is going crazy because lots of uh, uh, threads switching between uh, in your application, it's it's really hard to debug, and as a result, to maintain. Okay, and question. Uh, a logical question arise, can we have really maintainable, scalable, and observable uh, Java application at the same time? But before we try to answer on this question, um, let's let's to have some baseline and namely, um, let's conduct some performance tests. I prepared uh, the following test environment. Uh, I took the most cheap digital ocean droplet, one shared virtual CPU, run, uh, RAM, uh, we have uh, 512 megabytes of disabled, we have uh, OS Ubuntu, Java 19, and a very old web server that uh, it was based by Sun in back to, I don't know, maybe 20 or six years. Uh, and since we don't have enough memory, we need to tune a bit our GVM and we have uh, 128 megabytes for heap and uh, uh, 64 megabytes for all heap. And uh, for load generating, we will use uh, K6. And we have a very straight, straightforward scenario. Uh, we need to check uh, HTTP response uh, for one test endpoint with timeout as it's equal to 10 seconds. So uh, I prepared results. Later, I promise you that uh, we will play uh, with uh, this web server. And uh, let me show you, show you how it looks like. I'm not sure that 
uh, you're familiar, maybe uh, some of you are familiar with this HTTP server, but it was uh, developed in Java 1.6, so it's re really a pretty old one, but it's working and it's what we need uh, to test and compare results. Uh, what's happening here? We have one uh, request handler, what we are doing, we uh, just uh, sleep on second and uh, respond um sending response with uh, html with uh, date now date time now and that's all uh cloud generator we have a uh, ramp up here in uh, 30 seconds and ramp up uh, of user will be equal uh, like a 25 percent of our target uh, amount of concurrent users then we jump into a stable amount of uh, virtual users without any delay. It's a K6 uh, trick. And then uh, we are emulating a concurrent user for one minute. Then we have a check-in and we validate that, okay, status was uh, 200 and it less than 10 seconds. And what we have the results. We have very interesting results here. Um, you can see uh, in axis Y, it's amount of concurrent users that we are emulating for one minute. And for axis X, we have a response time in second and it's 95% uh, uh, tip. Quite obvious that in order to handle uh, one, uh, in order to handle 500 uh, concurrent users, uh, we use uh, PT means uh, platform threads, by the way, and uh, this number, it's amount of threads uh, in a pool. So I play it with different amounts in a pool in order to understand where is the bottleneck and um, <clears throat> to have more fair results. Uh, for example, 500 concurrent users with 500 threads in a pool, our response time one second no magic everything is okay then we see that okay uh, let's try to to handle 1000 users and we see that response time two seconds also no magic a little slow in action uh, it's a double and we have for 2000 users we have big degradation and uh, starting from uh, this point we have uh, timeout request error. So in our case, it's 38 percentage. And one thing that is not obvious, and some of you may argue how it can be, it's uh, that we have uh, uh, two seconds, uh, two seconds for uh, for for thread pool where we are using uh, 1,000 threads but we are emulating only 500 users and how it can be. And actually it's about context switching and that uh, garbage collector comes and say, hey, I need to, 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 to remove uh, some stuff. And uh, because of this uh, transition and switching between uh, threads, we have this interesting behavior. And Project Loom to the rescue to provide an answer. And initially it was um, started uh, back into 2017 years. Um, and Ron Pressler, it's a guy, it's a technical lead of this project. And uh, this project in, uh, aims to to have a high throughput concurrent Java applications with uh, very good uh, hardware utilization. And at the same time uh, to have more maintainable uh, Java applications. And <clears throat> we have two jobs for this that currently included in Java 19. The first one uh, virtual threads and it's in preview mode and the second one structured concurrency. And unfortunately, it's only in incubator mode, but we have a chance to play with it. Okay. As you remember previously, we had a mapping uh, between uh, Java platform thread and OS thread, like uh, one-to-one. 
But here we see additional mapping where one Java platform thread can have uh, many virtual threads. And uh, it's maybe time to joke that uh, any complex uh, problem in uh, programming can be solved using additional layer of abstractions, abstraction, and maybe it's it's a case. Um, also interesting fact that now we have GVM scheduler to schedule uh, these virtual threads. And another uh, important aspect here is that stack frames that uh, needed uh, for virtual thread, they're located in heap. And it means that they can be garbage collected later. And heard why it's working and we're gonna see uh, how it's working and why. It's a, a fact that virtual thread is implementation of the limited scope of continuation. Uh, we're going to talk about it, uh, what uh, continuation uh, means. But before, we need to understand two key moments about virtual threads. The first one is mounting. GVM uh, scheduler uh, assigns uh, virtual thread uh, for execution uh, to some platform thread that is available in this uh, GVM scheduler pool. And uh, platform thread becomes carrier. A uh, good example, in my opinion, it's like a camel in the desert who, who is carrying out uh, you when you're going to Egypt or something like this. Uh, I mean, carrying on his back. And during mounting, uh, all required stack frames uh, temporarily copying from heap to stack of platform threads. And uh, virtual thread uh, can use it. And virtual threads can be mounted in two cases. First one, when we just create new threads, start, and that's all. Very simple use case. Second one, when we, when our task wasn't completed and we need to proceed uh, from last suspension point. It's a very interesting thing. Uh, I highlighted that we can continue the task. We can continue task from last suspension point. Okay, unmounting. Um, GVM does unmounting uh, of uh, virtual thread when it's waiting for IO, locking, or any uh, other source availability or task is done. And during the mounting, the opposite operation about uh, copying stack frames, uh, they uh, back to the heap. And uh, GVM yields control of using CPU to another thread, to another virtual thread. And uh, interesting thing that here that virtual thread can be unmounted in several cases. The first one, when we are using synchronized block. Uh, why? Really, I don't know. It needs to investigate sources uh, in C++ of uh, GVM, but it's what we have. Um, and when we are calling native or foreign function. And what said before, it sounds very, very interesting because now, we can have very good, really good CPU utilization. And let's consider the following example. We have uh, virtual thread one and uh, GVM scheduler has a, a free uh, platform thread and virtual thread is mounted. We are doing something and for example, in task uh, that we passed uh, to this virtual thread, we are calling database or third party or whatever, or reading from uh, disk something. Uh, GM understandings, and when we start execute this code, I mean calling something IO and waiting for response of something IO, 
our virtual chat just becomes mounted and that's all and provides a slot uh, uh, time slate time slice of CPU for another virtual chat. And when uh, GVM understands that this response from IO and we can proceed execution and also this permit to assign this virtual thread again, uh, virtual thread uh, one becomes again mounted and we continue execution. Okay, let's go forward. API. Now we have uh, the following API, very straightforward. We can just start virtual thread. Uh, it's a method in thread uh, uh, class and uh, pass uh, our runnable and basically it, it represents a task. Or we can use a new builder that was added to thread class as well, where we can specify name of virtual thread and task as well. Or we can create a virtual thread that will not be started. And we have new uh, executor where we create in new virtual chat per each task. Uh, and now it's time to, to, to look how it's working uh, in a server. And uh, let me, one second. Okay. It's a uh, chart that represents that represents um, comparison between using platform threads and virtual thread with the same example. Let's go to the call. Uh, what I did, I just. Uh, change uh, executors uh, with fixed thread pool to new thread executor, uh, per task executor, sorry. And everything working. And I love for this uh, reason Java because uh, I'm not sure that guys who develop uh, uh, this web server of, I don't know, 16 years ago thought that someone crazy guy will test it uh, with a virtual thread. Um, back to the slides and oops and uh, let's try to understand what's happening here we see that we can easily handle 2000 concurrent users easily no errors it's just working so double uh, scalability achieved and we uh, also see some uh, degradation uh, for response time for example uh, for 3,000 uh, concurrent users, uh, our response time will be two seconds. And for 4,000 users, uh, our response time will be almost four seconds. And for five, uh, more or less four seconds, plus minus. And, and a huge degradation when we are trying to handle 6,000. But guys, come on, it's the same hardware. Um, the same code, one thing is just another scheduler. It's amazing. And now it's time to play, as I promised you, with our uh, server. Uh, okay. I believe you see a terminal. So it's our server, uh, nothing special, uh, just to see, uh, to, to show HTOP, to understand what's happening. And uh, let me show you what we have, what kind of code we have. It's uh, pretty the same that I showed before. One thing here that I added uh, for simplicity uh, switching uh, between virtual threads and platform threads is if else statement. And uh, if we have a PT in command line, we will use uh, platform threads and uh, 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 specify and we need to specify amount of uh, threads for its pool. And if it's another case, just use virtual thread per task executor. Code the same, the same, nothing was changed. Okay, let's try to run. 
Uh, first, let's try to run this, uh, I don't know, this platform chats and maybe um, we thought that we had a problem with lots of threads, but it was connected to the fact that we are emulating a constant arriving of concurrent users. And now I gonna I gonna want to stress our application. What does it mean? It means uh, we are going to, to emulate concurrent users, some amount of concurrent user for one time, only one time to have a service base uh, without any uh, ramp up, uh, just one shot. Okay, let's try to uh, to have 2000 and see. Uh, let's to be sure that it's uh, working. Okay, it's uh, it shows our uh, actual time in GTC. And let's try to run uh, our stress generator. It was slow. Sorry, my bad. My bad. Uh, oh, you see, right? <laughs> uh, it's what I uh, told before that you can't just create many threads because because of limitations and also oh, come on, come on, not at this time. Oh, uh, okay. Second need to uh, to kill yeah it's a reason why you can't just create as many threads as you want it's a really big problem uh, it depends on your hardware it depends on your operation system limitation because there are some uh, configuration properties where you can tune also you can place with uh, uh, size of stack uh, for Java chat, but in fact, it's uh, limited. Okay, sorry, let's try again, but uh, for, for stress, for stress, it should work because And by the way, uh, we specified 5,000 5, uh, of concurrent user and we hear, <laughs> see lots of errors. Okay, we have only 14% of successful requests and our 95% um, is almost uh, 10 seconds, uh, almost. Yeah, and it's a problem. Ah, and uh, Ohm Killer uh, comes to us and killed our application. Uh, who doesn't know what, what is the uh, Ohm Killer? It's an um, uh, out of memory killer. It's a guy who is uh, watching uh, how many RAM your application consumes. And if, if, if this change that can affect uh, system processes in Linux, uh, it just kill, kills your applications and that's all. Okay, let's do the same, but with virtual threads. Okay, it started. It's working. And let's emulate load again. Oops. Whoa. It's a kind of magic. Uh, yeah, we have uh, response time, average response time, and not average, but 95% uh, till uh, response time, uh, six seconds, and everything, everything uh, was handled without any errors at all. The same code, just Java 19th and virtual threads. Now let's try to kill our application. Let's try to uh, eight thousands. I'm gonna mm, gonna want to find this uh, this bottom line, not bottom, but top line. 
Well, let's uh, restart uh, to to have more fair comparison. And let's run again. I remind you, it's uh, the same code base. Oh, we see uh, some errors, and it's quite obvious. Yeah, it's uh, our. Yeah, we can't handle more. Yeah, let's. Um, yeah, we can conclude here. Uh, virtual threads are working very well. Uh, with the same hardware, we can achieve uh, double or even triplet um, uh, scalability with the same code base. Okay, back to the presentation. Um, and this chart, by the way, uh, an A means not applicable. It means uh, my application just was killed or crashed or out of memory uh, I and mean, crashed due to out of memory. So it's, that's why it's not applicable. And in my opinion, uh, I think we need to know why and how it's working, uh, not to dig into some really internal details, but in general. Um, virtual threads uh, class uh, have the following uh, code. And interesting fact, initial uh, proposal from uh, Ron Pressler uh, had the mention about pluggable schedulers. But in current GDK as that are using, there is no possibility to pass your current, current uh, your custom scheduler. I don't know why. Maybe in the future, but it's not easy task to uh, to to create uh, GVM schedulers. To be honest, maybe it's uh, the reason. And another interesting thing that we see that we have a V-thread continuation, and I mentioned before that uh, virtual thread actually implements this uh, concept of continuation. And uh, in the code, we see that uh, this continuation accepts a virtual thread and our task. And then we run continuation. And now let's try to understand what is a continuation actually is. Um, continuation. It's a very complex topic and uh, I would say that it needs additional uh, session to, to talk about it. And uh, I am not good expert here, but I can share some, uh, some main ideas. Uh, we have a pseudocode about uh, continuation with different points. And what does it mean? We create continuation, some abstract continuation, which accepts some, some function. In our case, it's a form. It's a, a point zero. Then when this call continue first time, our full uh, function uh, starts executing. Uh, inside full, we are calling bar. Inside bar, we doing something, and when we reach suspend point three, we just suspending, do nothing, we're waiting. Then, if we receive some signal, remember I told told, uh, uh, told about uh, unmounting and mounting, and when we mount again, we continue execution. And here is the case is uh, uh, matching. When we uh, uh, call continue again, we continue execution from last suspension point. Uh, also digging into source code of virtual chat, I was interested in, for me, it, it's similar to state machine actually, to be honest, because we need to transit between the states. We need to keep in mind where we are and uh, what is uh, our possible transitions can be. And here we can see 
states for virtual thread. If some of you has in mind um, state diagram for platform threads, you can you can recognize easily that it's a bit different, right? It's not the same. It's really different. Uh, but here I can highlight several uh, potential execution pathways. The first one, when we create a, a new virtual thread, uh, it becomes started and, uh, no, sorry, when we create a thread and uh, if we uh, can't start, after start we go to terminate it because something went wrong, uh, I don't know, it's happened. It's a very uh, simple use case. Another one, when we successfully created, started, we are doing something, we are in running state, we are doing something uh, important for us in our task. And then we can have uh, several potential directions where we can go. If we call uh, something IO intensive again, we need to par, or even if you call sleep, simple example, sleep. Uh, our virtual thread trying to be parked. What does it mean? It means first uh, we we look at where we are. Okay, parking. And remember, I mentioned about that if we are using synchronized uh, block, your thread can be unmounted. And it's a problem. For uh, example, for, uh, you have uh, I know thread pool in GVM scheduler, ten threads, and uh, your task uh, using synchronized method and sleep for one second. So quite obvious that you will have uh, the same throughput as previously because uh, your virtual thread can't be unmounted. It's a very big problem, but if GVM is able to unmount your virtual thread because, uh, I don't know, because again, you're, you're calling some method, the GVM is aware about a possibility to park and unmount. Later, I also describe what is a um, huge work uh, was provided to prepare uh, Java to handle this uh, state. Okay, we are running, we're trying to park in. If everything okay, we are going to park it. And if everything is okay, we are going to runnable. Runnable means unmounted. So in runnable, uh, we are yield of CPU uh, slice time to another virtual chat uh, to perform some task. If virtual thread can't be unmounted because it's pinned, we are waiting for this. And after uh, end of reaching of our synchronized block, we go to runnable anyway. And from runnable, when we are mounting uh, again, um, from runnable, we are going to run in and again, execute something till our task uh, has been completed. Uh, or again, we reach some, uh, uh, parking point uh, or other stuff. Interesting uh, thing here, it's a yielding. If you remember in Java, we have a method in thread, thread uh, uh, class, we have a yield. And there's very interesting description in GLS, like uh, it's a hint for uh, operation system, system scheduler uh, to give up uh, time uh, CPU time slice uh, to other thread. And here is the same thing. Uh, but now for virtual thread, uh, uh, when we are calling uh, Yelp in virtual thread, it's a hint to GVM scheduler uh, to provide the CPU slice uh, for another thread. And here are two options. A GVM scheduler can ignore it as operation system scheduler because it's not determinated and it depends on scheduler and lots of other factors or it can be uh, take into account. And in this case, uh, virtual thread becomes unmounted, again, runnable. So runnable, it's unmounted. Running uh, mounting and we are doing something. 
And now he is a key guy. Uh, it's a Jvemsky door. No magic and uh, not surprised that it, it was implemented using work still in uh, for join pool in uh, first in first out mode. And uh, the parallelism of this schedule is just amount of uh, Java platform threads. Uh, here you can tune a bit uh, this uh, scheduler. And of course, observability in stack traces, in uh, exceptions, you will see uh, pretty clear where you are and what is happening. And uh, finally, uh, think here that by default, virtual thread name is empty. So please uh, take into account this. Again, observability, but here's a problem, as you can see, because uh, we are using just GCMD thread print and we don't see our virtual threads where, where they are, guys. And problem here is that default thread print doesn't show it at all. In order to see um, virtual threads in thread dumps, you need to use new uh, key thread dump to file. Now we have thread dump to file. You can export to this own file and see actually, and how it looks like. We clearly see our source code, our stack, where we are, what we are doing, uh, everything clear and transparent. And back to the peanut state, because it's very important. Um, if you wanna, show if you want to see uh, problems and uh, understand, okay, uh, maybe I'm using uh, synchronize or maybe I know, you can just enable uh, tracing for pin threads and uh, in the console, you will see something like this. And uh, GVM explicitly says, hey, come on, uh, web server uh, line 40, you have a problem and it means you have a synchronized block there. And as I mentioned before, GVM preparation, uh, there was lots of and tons of preparation. When I prepared this presentation, I just going crazy because uh, they re-implement legacy socket API and implement from scratch no socket uh, API again. Just, just think about it, socket API. On top of the socket API of socket class, everything can build off top of this uh, abstraction. It's just, it's, it's amazing. Also, we already seen uh, that thread dumps uh, improved. And there are lots of works uh, for preparation. Again, uh, remember we discussed about unmounting and GVM should know at which places um, virtual threads can be unmounted. And that's why uh, there was a re-implementation of socket API in order to give this hint to the GVM. So no magic, lots of changes. Also, <clears throat> uh, you can't use thread local. Actually you can, but there is a problem with it. And uh, later I will show you that the alternative solution for this and revisiting locking. If you can replace uh, synchronized uh, block with reentrant lock, for example, it can be the solution. Preparation again, no magic. Now uh, some of common, not common, but famous maybe uh, method in Java looks like this. Instance of virtual thread, we do something for sleep, for example, in a new socket temple we'll close, uh, we are doing also interesting stuff. We are checking is a virtual thread or not. Then we do some kind of magic that related only to virtual thread. Also lock uh, support park, uh, if, if or instance of everywhere now. And I believe it will be more in the future. And 
Interesting fact. Some of you uh, maybe recognize, hey, come on. Uh, I already seen the somewhere and it's very similar to, uh, to user threads actually. And back to Java 1.1, 1 .1, 1 .1, just remind, 1.1 is just insane. There was something that calls green threads. And uh, initially idea was more or less similar that uh, these threads uh, can be managed in scheduler by GVM scheduler. But uh, drawbacks of the thing that uh, green threads um, can, can be handled only one operating system thread and you can't utilize your multi-core processors. And that's why after 1.1, uh, this feature was removed from uh, Java at all, just, uh, and was replaced uh, with the mapping that we seen before, sorry, uh, where we have one-to-one -one mapping, where one Java platform uh, thread is a wrapper for operating system thread. What we can conclude here, uh, create, you can create one million of uh, virtual threads, easy because it's a Java entity, don't pull them. Uh, avoid using thread local and uh, a synchronized block. Uh, if you need uh, something to synchronize, use render on block. That's all about virtual threads. And now, our final destination, it's a structured concurrency. Maybe some of you aware about it, maybe know, and maybe know that, for example, in, uh, in .NET, uh, I see in Kuwait, in Kotlin, uh, Suspend, and other stuff. Idea more or less uh, the similar, but implementation may be different. Here's example, uh, we, we have, uh, for example, tasks that can be tasks that can be processed concurrently. And on left side, when task one starts uh, doing something and uh, produce task two in another thread, uh, and and then task two doesn't wait, uh, doesn't wait ending of task one. So we're just going to in parallel and that's all. And there is no relation. And uh, on the uh, uh, <clears throat> right side, we see that task one is waiting for executing task two and they depend. So it means there is a relation between them. And in general, it calls uh, structured concurrency. But this term comes from structured programming. And back to basic times, for example, where you have uh, line 10, uh, 10, 12, 30, 40, 50, and et cetera, there was a, a jumping between lines. And it's not it wasn't easy to understand uh, what is going actually in programming. And nowadays it can seem like a strange command, what you're talking about. <laughs> but in fact, it was, it's a, some part of history. And uh, structured programming uh, prevents a random jumping around the code base and program uh, offset uh, nested code blocks. And here is the same. Uh, the same idea, we are not jumping. We have a, a strictly relation between children and parents' uh, execution threads. And structured concurrency also embodies as a principle, if a task splits into concurrent subtask, they all, retain, uh, all return to the same place where they were started. Again, relation. Real example, it's not something uh, 
maybe unusual. I wrote the same code in my project, and I suspect you are doing the same. Uh, what's happening here? We have handle methods, and we are trying to find some users, and we uh, fetch order ID, and then we incorporate in one response and return. That's all. Very simple. But uh, what about paralyzing the work? We can write, we can uh, execute and separate uh, threads, uh, uh, separate threads, uh, our methods, and uh, then compare it together and return. So technically, it should work and it should give us speed up uh, in two times. In not in two times, it depends. Uh, how long uh, will be uh, each uh, method executed, but in general, we can say, okay, two times faster, some speed up. But there are serious drawbacks, actually. And first of all, uh, let's uh, play in a game that calls what if. What if find user throws an exception? And if it throws an exception, then uh, handle throws an exception when we are calling get. Um, and funny thing that our fetch order ID will be executed in a, in a thread. And it means we, we lost the thread. Our thread was leaked because we already saw the exception on the top but we continue trying to receive something uh, in fetch order ID. And when this response uh, comes, no one interested in this response at all. Another example, if thread executing handle is interrupted, there is no propagation to subtask. It just interrupts. And uh, we continue uh, handling uh, find user and fetch order ID. Again, minus two threads, not good at all. And another thing, if find user will take a much more time to execute and fetch order ID fails in the meantime. And we will see this failing only after uh, we receive response from find user. Again, just we are doing the, doing for nothing, and uh, it's not uh, good utilization of uh, threads and hardware. And structure concurrency and namely structure task scope uh, goes to the rescue. It's in your API. Um, and what's happening here? It's about scope. We're creating a scope where we can fork uh, different uh, different threads for uh, for handling our methods, some logic inside our methods. Uh, and what give us? First of all, we have error handling with short circuiting. What it means? It means if uh, someone uh, of task will fail uh, in uh, faster than another whole scope will be failed. We propagate cancellation to all forks and no one thread can be leaked. Everything under control, no exceptional case. Uh, clarity. Here is pretty simple uh, and straightforward code that, okay, we fork uh, find user, we fork fetch order ID, then we join and we throw if fail it. Okay, understandable. Then we incorporate uh, results from both and return. Shutdown policies. We already have seen uh, shutdown on failure policies. There are two policies uh, default uh, that provided by GVM, uh, by GDK, sorry. Uh, shutdown on failure and shutdown on success. 
For example, real use case. Uh, we have a SLA in our project and we think about recover recoverability, blah, blah, blah. And okay, we have uh, one data provider, but then, uh, okay, we can have two data providers that can provide the same data. And we have a SLA, like, okay, we uh, need to provide response for client less than one second, so one second and less. Okay, uh, we are calling two data providers uh, with deadline. And uh, who first? It wins. Very simple. Uh, shutdown on failure, if you remember in completable future, we have a, a all off and shutdown on success. It's similar to completable future any off. I mean, from semantical uh, standpoint, is this similar? Uh, before we have seen a fun out scenario when we uh, fork something and uh, wait in some point to set uh, all forks should be completed at the same point. Here is example of fun in scenario. Uh, and basically it's example of a very simple TCP server. Um, <clears throat> by default uh, method that should be overridden uh, instructed uh, task call is empty and uh, here is nothing in terms of uh, handle complete response, for example. Uh, but if after forking uh, for new client uh, virtual thread, uh, something goes wrong with whole server, we automatically close all connections uh, and that's all. Also very straightforward logic and no sense to, to, to make a mistake. And of course, you can create other, uh, your own custom scope. What you need for this, extend structure task scope and to write handle complete method. Logic inside uh, this method should be straight safe. Um, <clears throat> here's examples that we are just uh, retaining all results. Observability. Um, Let's imagine we have the following uh, example. We have a parent uh, which where we uh, fork handle method and in handle method we have uh, another scope where we fork our uh, uh, well-known uh, two methods, find user and fetch order ID. In uh, dump to file, uh, file uh, sorry, dump to file, uh, a response uh, of GCMD, we will see something like this. We'll see, okay, we have a container. Here we have a container and we have a threads and threads ID have uh, 23. Um, and we have another container and we see that owner of this, uh, of this thread, of this container, uh, thread with number 23. Quite obvious. Also, we can see this relation uh, taking into account uh, parent uh, and uh, container uh, fields. For example, this is parent uh, thread of log has uh, 31, 27, blah, blah, blah. And container uh, with this name, it's uh, this one. And it's a root. And also, we see thread count. Uh, that our parent has uh, one thread, quite obvious, and uh, children, we have two children, two threads. And uh, if we expand uh, the stack traces, we can see the following. We see uh, places where we are, nothing special. Uh, we are calling handle. In child one thread, we are calling find user. In the child two stack test, we are calling fetch order ID. So it's just working. Okay, conclusions. <clears throat> what we can conclude? Project Loom drastically improves uh, maintainability, scalability, reliability, observability, lots of ability, sorry, uh, full uh, of uh, multi threaded code. Uh, also, virtual threads. Uh, give us chance to rewrite our uh, thread per request style uh, web, web applications to have very good hardware optimization without uh, minimal changes. And you already see, seen indeed, right? 
uh, we need to change on the uh, pool and don't use synchronize. Maybe it's a problem, but anyway. And by the way, I uh, searched it um, for one thing and some guy uh, on the internet uh, calculated how many places, for example, um, Spring uh, has synchronized method and uh, Hibernate, for, for example, and other uh, famous framework in Java. And well, it will not be easy task for them uh, to rewrite it, to be honest. And structured concurrency, it's a new model that promotes a uh, new way of thinking and of and not only way of thinking, but no, oh, new way of programming a uh, concurrent application where we can uh, eliminate a common problem with cancellation and shutdowning, uh, error propagations and other stuff. And Java platform thread still exists. It's a true, no one decides to remote, you can use it uh, as you're using right now. Um, sad news, virtual threads in preview and structured concurrency in incubator. It means that virtual threads maybe will have, I don't know, a second preview and I don't know in which version of Java it will be a part, official part. And incubator, uh, yeah, structured concurrency in incubator, maybe, in next release, it will be in a preview and then will be included as a part of, uh, of main release. <clears throat> and that's all uh, for today. Uh, thank you for having me. I believe you, uh, you enjoyed uh, the journey with me and it's a time for questions. Really great presentation, thank you. Um, hi, uh, so I have one question. Can we say that uh, all existent uh, multi-thread API uh, will work with uh, new virtual threads? Like future, complete will future, et cetera? Yeah, it will, will be the same. So uh, we have uh, we have this uh, magic uh, words like, right? Like, uh, uh, write once, run everywhere. So backward compatibility for Java, it's a top priority. Yeah, everything will work as you're expecting. And a virtual thread is just an object on uh, in Java heap. Yes, entity, just entity. Right, but uh let's say we created the virtual thread and we went to the you know to the database and fetch a huge chunk of uh, data uh can it somehow uh, impact this this virtual thread Does it, uh, have... it, it will have the same impact as you have uh, right now uh if you need to perform or handle some big piece of memory in a heap and you don't have enough heap you will have out of memory no magic.